I got some sad news to tell you, and I want you to hear it from me uh, before uh, it goes public, because I owe it to you. I'm your pastor. Cardinal Dolan announcing that a bishop of the New York Archdiocese is stepping aside over a credible sexual abuse allegation. United against hate after the synagogue shooting, the power of faith on display by Brooklyn Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio, the Cardinal, and other religious leaders in the city. In Pittsburgh, more victims of the anti-Semitic massacre are laid to rest. Plus, the troops have arrived in Texas, a show of force against the migrant caravan marching to the border. The news starts right now. Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Faubles. Bishop John Jenick of the New York Archdiocese is accused of a credible and substantiated allegation of sexual abuse. The bishop is denying those claims, but he's giving up two jobs, auxiliary bishop and pastor of a Bronx church. Currents News' Michelle Powers is standing by at the Archdiocese Chancery with the latest. Michelle, what can you tell us? Bishop Jenick has long been recognized as a pillar in his Bronx community, but now a man in his 50s is alleging that the bishop led an inappropriate relationship with him when he was a teenager. Again, Bishop Jenick is denying those claims. Bishop John Jenick, an auxiliary bishop in the Archdiocese of New York, is the latest prelate accused of sexual abuse. He is now under review by the Vatican. Cardinal Timothy Dolan announced in a letter to parishioners at Our Lady of Refuge Parish in the Bronx, where Jenick serves as pastor, that an allegation had been made against him through the Archdiocese Independent Reconciliation and Compensation Program. In his letter and in this video message, Cardinal Dolan said that this was the first accusation made against the bishop. Bishop John Jenick, one of my auxiliary bishops and the longtime beloved pastor up at Our Lady of Refuge in the Bronx, uh, he's stepping aside today because of a credible allegation of sexual abuse. Uh, this is sad. Uh, this is sad for all of us. It's sad for the victim. And I sure appreciate that victim coming forward, accepting my invitation to all victims to come forward. It's certainly a, a sad day for Bishop Jenick. It's a very sad day for the people of Our Lady of Refuge Parish who love him and cherish him. Bishop Jenick is known as a staple to the northernmost borough where he served most of his priestly duties since first being ordained in 1970. In 2014, the much-loved Bronx priest that reportedly dodged gunfire, rallied for affordable housing, and fought against drug dealers was named a bishop to assist Cardinal Dolan in the Archdiocese of New York. Jenick also wrote a letter to his parishioners that says this was the hardest thing he's ever written in his 48 years of priesthood. While I have utmost respect for both the IRCP and the review board and know that they have a great burden to confront the evil of sexual abuse, I continue to steadfastly deny that I have ever abused anyone at any time. Now I have the rest of that letter here where Bishop Jenick writes, I will be stepping aside and moving as pastor of Our Lady of Refuge until this matter is settled. From the Upper East Side, Michelle Powers, Currents News. Michelle, do you know if Cardinal Dolan has spoken about the case since the news broke this morning? Liz, my colleague Tim Harfman was at a public event this morning and he did approach Cardinal Dolan, but he had no comment on the matter. He did say that he wants everyone to be praying for the survivor who came forward. So we have our prayers are with him. All right, Michelle, thank you so much for that update. The Brooklyn Diocese has a toll-free and confidential sexual abuse reporting line. That number is 888-634-4499. And for more information, go to the Diocese of Brooklyn's website, dioceseofbrooklyn.org, and click on Protecting Our Children. Turning now to a powerful display of strength against hate that claims so many lives inside a Pittsburgh synagogue. Brooklyn's Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio, Cardinal Dolan, and other top religious leaders showed unity at a well-known Manhattan synagogue. Currents News' Tim Harfman was there. Over 100 worshipers gathered at the Park East Synagogue to stand together in prayer and unite against hatred. We stand together as one. One of many religious leaders in attendance, the Bishop of Brooklyn, Nicholas DiMarzio, he says regardless of denomination, worshipers must be strong following the Pittsburgh shooting. We can't be afraid to worship. That's one of the basic freedoms we have in the United States. 
If we stay home because we're afraid of uh, coming to a place of worship, we let those who are purveyors of hate win. So we can't have that happen. A message echoed by New York's Cardinal Timothy Dolan. Have faith in God during this tragic time. He wants us not to wallow in mourning, but to behold a fresh morning where his grace and mercy rises unfailingly with his son. Wearing United Against Hate t-shirts, students from the neighboring Jewish elementary school lit candles for the 11 men and women killed at Tree of Life Synagogue. Lauren Meyer, who teaches the Manhattan students, grew up in Pittsburgh and attended Temple there. I know um, a couple of the victims is from, you know, high holidays and Saturday and Sunday mornings there, and it's heartbreaking. They're related to some of my friends, and it's devastating what they're going through. But for these worshipers, they stand strong in faith. Our country in many ways seems divided at this period of our history, which is a terrible thing, but we are united in faith. And this terrible tragedy that happened in the Jewish community affects all of us. So we're here today to show our solidarity with one another. This is a very important message that we need to send to the entire society that uh, Jews and Judaism is not alone in fighting anti-Semitism and that other denominations, other religions are going to be with Jews facing the threat. And at the end of the service, worshipers sang God Bless America and reiterated their message of hope faith and to stand together against hatred. On the Upper East Side, Tim Harfman, Currents News. In Pittsburgh, three more victims of the anti-Semitic madman who opened fire at a synagogue last Saturday were laid to rest today. Kelly Smoot has the latest. This is a small community that we all know each other and we're burying our dead. Uh, we're mourning with our, our community. More funerals today in Pittsburgh. Mourners gathered at services for three of the 11 victims of Saturday's synagogue shooting. 75-year-old Joyce Feenberg was a retired research specialist at the University of Pittsburgh. 69-year-old Irving Younger was a former real estate agent and greeter at the Tree of Life Synagogue. He loved his loved going there and he was just loved life. And 87-year-old Melvin Wax was an accountant and Pittsburgh Pirates fan. His sister-in-law said Melvin loved his religion. He was just a good soul. He, he loved to tell jokes to everybody. 11 people were gunned down Saturday morning at the Tree of Life Synagogue during worship services. The suspect in the case, 46-year-old Robert Bowers, is in jail. And a federal grand jury today issued a 44-count indictment. If convicted, Bowers could ultimately face the death penalty. My office charged Robert Bowers with federal murder and assault charges relative to the horrific acts of violence he committed at the Tree of Life Synagogue. Bowers will next appear in court tomorrow at 10 a.m. At that time, we will have the opportunity to present evidence demonstrating that Robert Bowers murdered 11 people who were exercising their religious beliefs and that he shot or injured six others. Kelly Smoot, Currents News. Top Catholic migration agencies are backing those migrant caravans trying to get into the U.S., saying that seeking asylum is not a crime. One of three Central American groups on the move stopped to rest overnight at Oaxaca, Mexico, still weeks away from reaching U.S. soil. President Trump is sending more military personnel to the border to keep them from crossing. The White House has accused the migrants of posing a threat to national security. 800 U.S. soldiers have already arrived in San Antonio, Texas, the first wave of thousands of troops being deployed by the White House. They're part of Operation Faithful Patriot and are being sent as a show of force against the caravan. Cargo planes loaded with heavy equipment, vehicles and materials are among what's been sent to major military bases. They'll serve as staging areas for the 5,200 troops heading to the southwest border. This includes special operation teams, some for riot control, in advance of an unknown number of Central American migrants possibly reaching ports of entry or points in between. The units that are normally assigned weapons, they are in fact deploying with weapons. But the commander of the U.S. Northern Command says American troops are following the law. Posse comitatis, soldiers are not to take action on American soil. Everything that we are doing is in line with an adherence to posse comitatis. 
The NORTHCOM commander says the military and its resources will be used only in a support role. Still, some are saying the deployment is the latest example of demonizing immigrants. At a news conference Monday, the commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection was asked whether the deployment was actually a campaign ploy. No, this is a law enforcement operation from CBP's perspective, and we partner with DOD all the time to help secure our border. Those 5,200 troops, after focusing on the Texas border, will then switch to Arizona and California. The spat over birthright citizenship between President Trump and House Speaker Paul Ryan got a little sharper today. Ryan said the provision in the Constitution can't be changed only with an executive order. The president tweeted this morning Paul Ryan should be focusing on holding the majority rather than giving his opinion on birthright citizenship, something he knows nothing about. Our new Republican majority will work on this, closing the immigration loopholes and securing our border. Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega is reportedly forcing all public employees to sign a petition calling on the Vatican to denounce Auxiliary Bishop Silvio Baez. Local pro-government news outlets claim to have audio recordings of the bishop urging a coup to bring down Ortega's regime. Relations between the Nicaraguan government and the Catholic Church have been tense since anti-government protests broke out in April. The latest outrage as violence against Christians significantly increases in Nigeria. Five religious sisters from the Order of the Missionary of Martha and Mary were abducted, along with two others in Nigeria's Delta State. The nuns were returning from a funeral when the abductors started shooting at them. The Islamist terror group Boko Haram has been threatening safety in the entire state. <laughs> Good news tonight from Pakistan. The Supreme Court is sparing the life of Asia Bibi. The Christian woman had been on death row for almost eight years on blasphemy charges. Now she's won her appeal against the conviction. The mother of five was sentenced after being accused of defiling the Prophet Muhammad during an argument. It's a special story about someone who made a big impact in the lives of others. It's in this week's tablet, and Editor-in-Chief Jorge Dominguez is here with a preview. Then, a mystery at the Vatican, the discovery of bones that could be connected with a murder. And not scary at all. From the streets of Brooklyn, a celebration of Halloween delights. The Diocese of Brooklyn is rejecting claims in a new lawsuit. Attorney Jeff Anderson announcing the suit against all New York State dioceses during a news conference yesterday. His client, sexual abuse survivor Paul Dunn, is suing to make the names and documents of all priests accused of abuse public. Dunn says a now deceased Queens priest, Father Cornelius Otero, abused him in the 1970s. I'm here to say this has to stop here and now and it begins today with this lawsuit. Thank you. Dunn says he rejected a $200,000 settlement offered by the Brooklyn Diocese Independent Reconciliation and Compensation Program. He also claims that the diocese is still protecting predator priests. The diocesan spokesperson released a statement reading, in part, we reject those claims and look forward to fighting them in court. Of the 13 names of priests presented, 12 are deceased. We have numerous programs in place for the protection of children and adults. We have an independent reporting line where anyone can report a case of sexual abuse and the report goes straight to law enforcement authorities. And we have been working closely with the district attorneys in Brooklyn and Queens since 2002. Here are some of those details for you. The Office of Victim Assistance has been established to help individuals who come forward with allegations of abuse. The office provides counseling, referrals for therapy, and other important resources. Also important to note here, every employee of the diocese, including students, undergoes mandatory training designed to spot the signs of abuse and how to stop it. The bishop meets with survivors and listens to them carefully. One result of those talks is the annual Mass of Hope and Healing in the diocese. The diocese also has a toll-free and confidential sexual abuse reporting line. That number is 888-634-4499. And for more information, go to the Diocese of Brooklyn's website, dioceseofbrooklyn.org, and click on Protecting Our Children tonight.
a special preview of the latest edition of the Tablet newspaper. Its pages are a great source for news stories and other information, all very important to Catholics. Editor-in-Chief Jorge Dominguez is here to highlight one account in particular that illustrates all the best in people. Jorge, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm excited to talk about this. Father Christopher Henyu, who is no stranger, of course, to Currents News, wrote a very heartfelt column in this week's paper. It was about a woman who embodies the true meaning of, of humility and holiness. Tell us about that. Oh, it's a touching story. Mm -hmm. Her name was Caroline. That's the title of the story. And that's the name of the person and she was like one of those people that we sometimes take for granted she was there always in the first pew of the church of the holy child greeting everybody as you know as father he just say mm -hmm. as she was the queen of richmond oh. and the, she, she passed away recently but it was a beloved figure in the parish what brought her to the faith how can her story just inspire others to to seek the catholic church she had a very, very tough childhood, mm -hmm. and, and she was a very simple person. She lived by her, herself, and the faith was the, the, the way that she dealt with all the, her past was by the, her faith in, uh, in her Catholic devotion. And for her being in church was being in a place of peace. And little by little, she was showing all of this, <laughs> how to live and how to deal with our own personal tragedies. And she did that by going above and beyond, right? She even carried around a special tool that would help her keep the neighborhood clean. Please tell us the, about that. Oh, yes. They, they call her the lady with the broom. Oh. She, would, would, she, she went around the neighborhood, mm -hmm. she, uh, sweeping the streets. And uh, I mean, th that tells you, she, uh, she was 80 when she passed away mm -hmm. recently. And for the, the last decade, that she has been around the neighborhood, sweeping the, the streets and, and around the parish too. And that was the way that she contributed to her community. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the message of the colonists, uh, I think, is, is, is very powerful in the sense of saying, those persons that we take for granted, those persons that we think are simpler than anybody else, sometimes are so essential to our life, mm -hmm. and they have such an important message to give us. So, yeah, you have to read the tablets. You absolutely have to read it. Like you said at the start of this interview, people like that, we take them for granted. What a great story. I look forward to reading it myself. Thank you, Jorge, as always. Thank you, Liz. Supporting the tablet really ensures that Catholic journalism will thrive well into the future. These are the stories that oftentimes can't be found anywhere else subscribe to the tablet right now you save up to 55 percent go to the website thetablet.org slash home 55 or you can call 1-877-883-8356 still to come on currents news bones have been found at a vatican building and authorities want to know if there's a connection with the infamous disappearance of a teenager decades ago and the halloween walkathon that's fun for kids and important for their school We'll be right back. A possible murder mystery story this Halloween night involving the Vatican. Bones were discovered during the remodeling of a building attached to the Vatican's embassy to Italy. Authorities don't yet know who the fragments belong to. There's speculation the case could involve a teenage girl named Emanuela Orlandi who disappeared in 1983. This mystery, as you might imagine, is raising a lot of questions. How did the bones end up there and who do they actually belong to? Authorities are still trying to piece all that together. While the investigation continues, senior correspondent for Crux, Elise Harris, remains on top of this story and she joins us now to talk about it. Elise, interesting stuff. What is the latest from Italian authorities and the Vatican on this investigation? It is a very interesting story indeed, not one that we normally get um, on our beat here. Um, as of now, there are no new details that have emerged about this. We got the an announcement pretty late last night um, from the Vatican's press office. And so right now, all we've heard is that the police have contacted the right people to make the investigations to see who these bones belong to, when, you know, how old they are, when this person might have died, and what could have happened to them. So at this point, they're saying, let's wait, let's see what these investigations yield, and let's see if we can get to the bottom of the mystery of what happened to this person. Now, Elise, as this mystery widens, Italian press is speculating that these could be the bones of a young woman named Emanuela Orlandi. Why would they believe that it's her? 
you know, the Orlandi case has been something that's been floating around um, for many years. Uh, she is a young woman who, at the age of 15, disappeared in 1983. Um, Italian press have been captivated by this story ever since then. Um, and, of course, because... Italians, you know, they, they get very into these conspiracies, you know, and there have been a lot of theories about what could have happened to her because her father at the time was an employee of the Vatican Bank. And so if we look back to the 1980s, there were several financial scandals that were happening at the time. And amid those scandals, you know, the Vatican had kind of bankrolled this project to clean itself up, right? Mm -hmm. And in the midst of that, you know, the theory as the theory goes, um, some funding from mafia um, was exposed and it left certain individuals vulnerable and in order to put pressure on the Vatican into um, not exposing some of those details they didn't want to go public, um, Emanuela was kidnapped. Um, John Paul II had made a public appeal for her safe return and so you had a lot of theories going on um, at the time, you know, suggesting that maybe her father's connection to the Vatican Bank had, you know, and the scandals at the time had a play um, in her disappearance. Um, those questions, those theories have never been proven. Her body was never found. And so this has remained just a big open mystery ever since. And so with the finding of these bones, you know, particularly on Vatican property, um, the questions again have resurfaced. Could this be her? Could it be, you know, some sort of symbolic burial, you know, of her body on Vatican property? You know, and so this is re, um, reawakening a lot of these rumors that we'd seen before. And it really kind of bringing this back to the fore in the public eye here in, in Italy. Elise, I, for one, am very intrigued and eager to discover if these bones actually did belong to Emanuela, so that means we have to check back with you to see how the investigation is progressing. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. My pleasure. A German cathedral is paying tribute to Pope Francis. This gargoyle appears on the main portal of the Cologne Cathedral, known for its Gothic architecture. Traditionally being featured in Gothic cathedrals is an honor and a reason for pride. Other people have also been immortalized in the cathedral, including President John F. Kennedy and French President Charles de Gaulle. Students at Brooklyn St. Joseph, the Worker Catholic Academy, gathered for their Halloween walkathon this morning. The streets were lined with ghouls, goblins, and superheroes. The walkathon is an annual event where the school raises money to use on supplies and classroom materials. Here's a look at the sights and the sounds. <laughs> It's a fundraiser that we have every year. It's a chance for the kids to get dressed up and show their creativity. Oh, that's an awesome outfit. Let's go kindergarten! We do it as a fundraiser, so it's a combination of fun, but also trying to raise funds for the school. Nice. Things that kids can use throughout the year. A little party afterwards, so basically it's just a fun time for everybody. We get a lot of parents who are involved, so you see a lot of parents around here with the kids as well. All right. Thank you, Mom. Ready to roll? We're grateful for their support. When you do another lap, you can get another time. I have twins in third grade. This is our sixth year doing it, and it's a lot of fun. Their grandparents come down for it, and we do it every year, and the whole neighborhood loves it. We also try to remind them what the, the season really is about, about it's Halloween. It's a Catholic holiday, and we want to keep it that way. Oh my goodness, cute overload. And on that ghoulish note, we wish you a very happy Halloween. That is Currents News. I'm Liz Fawbless. Thank you so much for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.